So this is the nitrogen cycle. And it's important to understand that the nitrogen and ammonia that you reduce in wastewater treatment is part of this larger cycle. The most commonly thought of input of nitrogen is the biological nitrogen in plants, animals, um, animal waste, and soil runoff. There's also nitrate in groundwater, as we see on the left-hand side here. Um, and nitrate, unlike ammonia, is not bound to soil or clay particles, so it can move through the soil and end up in your groundwater. Uh, so if your plant has a lot of input from infiltration in an agricultural area, you may deal with high nitrate in your plant. There is also nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, up here on the right-hand side, that can enter in the waterways or soil through bacteria, and these bacteria can convert nitrogen gas into ammonia in a process called nitrogen fixation. The process of nitrogen fixation tends to release a lot of ammonia or amino acids into the surrounding water or soil. These bacteria may be part of the plant rhizome, as in your field crops, or cyanobacteria in pond, as in that upper right-hand corner, or could just be normal bacteria that make up the community in your wastewater treatment plant. Biological treatment is used to prevent most of this nitrogen and other compounds from ending up in our environment and leading to undesirable outcomes such as algal blooms in lakes, fish die off, and prevalent prevalence of nitrate or nitrite in drinking water wells. Many of the oxic and anoxic pathways in this picture are also occurring in wastewater. Nitrogen takes several forms in wastewater and will just go through all these terms so that everyone's on the same page, and then we'll look at some of these a little more closely. Organic nitrogen is the nitrogen that's found in BOD. Ammonia nitrogen is kind of a shorthand term that incorporates ammonium, the NH4 plus ion, as well as ammonia, the uncharged NH3. Nitrite and nitrate are two oxidized products of ammonia nitrogen. When nitrogen Nitrification occurs, ammonia is oxidized to nitrate, which is denitrified all the way to nitrogen gas and released back into the atmosphere. TKN, or total kildrel nitrogen, is one common measurement that's used a lot in wastewater, and that's just the sum of the organic nitrogen plus the ammonia nitrogen. And we've got a few molecules here on the bottom. Uh, starting from left to right, we're looking at ammonium or ammonia. Uh, this one would be ammonium because there are four hydrogens. If you take away one of the white spears, the hydrogen, that would be ammonia. In the middle here, we have nitrite. And on the far right here, we have nitrate. And these three forms are what makes up the inorganic nitrogen in wastewater. But going back to the organic nitrogen, um, mostly it's going to come in through the influent in three forms. One is in the form of proteins, another is free amino acids, and the last would be urea. Proteins, back on the top left here, are the long chains of amino acids. And if you look very closely at that protein molecule in the center of the screen, um, it's broken down into individual amino acids. So you see here, and the amino group is what we call the nitrogen containing group of the amino acids. As these organic nitrogen compounds are being converted in the wastewater treatment process, the nitrogen that's bound up in the proteins mostly gets released and becomes part of this whole nitrification process. There's some small amount of organic nitrogen that will never be released, and it will actually go right through the plant and never leave its organic form. This could occur in, in proteins that are uh, a high content of your wastewater, such as in meat processing plants or cheese or dairy processing plants. And the biggest nitrogen uh, contributor to municipal influent is generally urea. So there's the urea molecule at the bottom center, and it's through the urease enzyme on the left here that ammonia is released in your wastewater treatment plant. So nitrification. Um, this is where ammonia is, enters the nitrification process. And for plants that are not nitrifying well, they don't actually progress through these two separate steps of ammonia oxidation, and the ammonia could just end up leaving the plant in its original form. So the nitrification process, the ammonia on the left gets converted to nitrite, 
And then here on the bottom, the second step, the nitrite gets converted to nitrate. And this is a biological process, and it takes place with the help of bacteria and the enzymes that, that those bacteria create. Uh, the oxidation of ammonia to nitrite is primarily done through nitrosomonas and nitrospira. Um, over here, we've got an image of nitrosomonas on the left-hand side. This is a picture using an electron microscope. You won't see these bacteria using a regular light microscope because they are very, very small. It would look like a pinprick on the screen. Uh, we also have some ammonia that is removed by heterotrophic nitrifiers. And the next step in the process is primarily done through nitrobacter, and that is the oxidation of nitrite to nitrate. So nitrifiers um, use this whole oxidation process to generate energy. This process doesn't generate anywhere near as much energy as heterotrophs get from oxidizing glucose. And because ammonia and nitrate oxidizers are autotrophs, they actually have to use inorganic carbon from the environment to make their own organic carbon that they can then use as energy, just as heterotrophs do. Uh, this is sort of similar to how plants and algae function, if you can, if you need a correlation. So nitrifiers have more steps involved. Um, they use more energy, and the net energy they gain is lower than for heterotrophs, such as flock formers. So heterotrophs, like your flock formers, are in your mixed liquor suspended solids. They're using the high energy organic carbons and they're basically getting a lot more out of it. So they put less energy in and they get more energy out um, and the flock forming bacteria are able to build their populations much more quickly than the nitrifying bacteria. So the microorganisms are the bacteria we just discussed. Um, if you look here um, at those energy pathways on this slide and the previous slide, they kind of show how they're gaining their energy. Um, we, if you remember back to the other side, they're oxidizing nitrogen, but not getting a lot of energy from it and still have to go through sort of the same process as heterotrophs to build their, uh, new cellular biomass. Um, in contrast, the heterotrophic bacteria get a lot of energy out of their process and in less steps. So they're able to just build up their populations much, much more quickly. Um, heterotrophs also do require some nitrogen, which they mostly take in as ammonia or free amino acids. And here's the growth rate, just to uh, sort of illustrate how fast or slowly our, very, our respective bacteria are growing. So this is based on uh, wastewater that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the doubling time for your heterotrophs could be anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes or even less. Whereas the doubling time for the nitrifiers is anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. And in some cases, it could be longer than that. And the rate that these nitrifiers build is faster in warmer water and slower in cooler water. Um, that's just very general for both types of bacteria. Um, so if you're looking just at this chart and taking your uh, wastewater temperature to just be 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the active biomass in a treatment plant um, that is currently nitrifying may only be about 10% of the biomass is going to be made up of nitrifying bacteria. And the way they typically end up entering the wastewater treatment plant is from the environment. Um, like I mentioned in our nit nitrogen cycle overview, these processes are going on outside of the wastewater plants and in the environment. So nitrifying bacteria exist in the soil and waterways, and any amount of these environmental inputs that wash into the plant will bring in some of that nitrifying bacteria. So this is just uh, to get a perspective of what may be going on with your activated sludge and how that relates to nitrification. Uh, you need to have healthy flock formers and good BOD removal before nitrification can occur. Healthy flocks means your sludge age is not too young and not too old if you can see this graph here. So the really uh, dangerous points are in red here. The sort of all right is in yellow and you really wanna be in the green healthy zone. Um, if your sludge age is too young here on the left-hand side, you have more BOD than your bacteria can remove in a good time frame, And this means the nitrifiers can't get enough oxygen within that same time frame to oxidize ammonia. 
Uh, the flock formers will use up all the oxygen as fast as they can, and they compete better for oxygen than nitrifiers do. If the flock formers don't use up all the BOD flat fast enough, you also won't get good settling with clear effluent. And in some cases, you may not even get flock formation. That would be at the very young end of the sludge age. Um, conversely, if your sludge age is too old, you may see poor BOD removal or the disintegration and breakup of the flock as bacteria inside it die. Uh, you may also have flock breakup due to the growth of filamentous bacteria at this old sludge age. If your sludge age stays too old for a prolonged period of time, you may also get foam formation. Uh, this could occur because of fine particles and dead microbes floating on the surface of your aeration basin. These particles can stabilize air bubbles and cause foaming. Um, old sludge also seems to favor the growth of nocardioforms. Uh, these are the branch filaments and they look like little tumbleweeds under the microscope. Uh, these will also float on the surface and can lead to really large foaming events that can completely upset your entire operation. Uh, foam and scum will also reduce the amount of oxygen diffusion from the surface of the basin into the rest of your water. Uh, this can be a significant reduction in oxygen of your mixed liquor and can also lead to lower nitrification efficiency. So here's some example of how flocks form. Uh, starting from the left, we have an example of very young sludge. As you can see, there's hardly any flock and it's mostly just free bacteria. This is where heterotrophs thrive. However, they are happily swimming around instead of forming fl good settling flocks. Um, in the middle, we have flock going from young to healthy. There is noticeable flock now and still some free bacteria. Uh, this indicates that there is still a little too much BOD for the current amount of active bacteria to use in the aeration time. And the heterotrophs are still using a lot of the oxygen and some nitrogen. This leaves little time for ammonia removal through nitrification in the aeration cycle or within that particular hydraulic retention time. At the right is a picture of the healthy flock that we want. Um, in this case, there is good flock formation and relatively low amounts of free bacteria. Uh, this means that bacteria are using up the incoming BOD relatively fast, so nitrifiers have some time and more oxygen to oxidize that leftover ammonia all the way to nitrate. Uh, for nitrifiers in a wastewater treatment process to be happy and healthy, they do have some requirements. And this is what we call the nitrification wheel, and we're going to look at a lot of these components individually. The first topic will be the nitrifiers, when the nitrifiers themselves get knocked out for some reason. Uh, for most wastewater treatment plants, when they have an issue with nitrification, it can fall into one of two categories. Um, there's an acute issue where the plant has historically nitrified pretty well and something's happened and their nitrifiers were lost. Um, that's compared with a plant that has more of a chronic issue. Uh, that is, they've never been able to nitrify great and that's usually because one or multiple factors in this nitrification wheel are not being met. Um, but first, we're just going to look at some or just talk about some of the more common acute issues uh, where nitrifying bacteria are lost. Uh, one major reason is they may be lost due to high flow rates. So if a rainfall event leads to higher than average flows in a plant, um, the plant may get washed out. They may lose a lot of their bacteria. And even if they don't lose, uh, say, half their mixed liquor, uh, nitrifiers only make up a relatively small percentage of the bacteria in a plant. So losing what seems like a moderate amount of mixed liquor will greatly magnify the impact on the nitrifying bacteria population. The other common acute issue uh, is biocides. So systems that are commonly fed by food processors or industry where they need lots of cleanliness in their production process, um, it's common for those plants to be using some sort of sanitizer, and we broadly call these biocides. Uh, parasitic acid is one example, and another one is quaternary amines. So quaternary amines uh, and other biocides are designed to kill bacteria indiscriminately. So when they're sprayed on the surface, um, they end up getting washed down into a floor drain and eventually into a wastewater plant. For systems where there's a lot of dilution going on with other types of influent, the diluted biocides may not be a problem. 
but if there's a large dump or a processor who uses biocide to make up a large percentage of your influent, then they can quickly become a problem. Uh, these issues are generally compounded when it happens during winter, if there's a slug of biocide or heavy rain events. Uh, and it's just these compounding factors that might make nitrification really difficult to bring back up to uh, acceptable levels for your plant. All right, uh, the big usually controllable factor that people run into with the nitrifiers is dissolved oxygen. Uh, so these nitrifying bacteria are aerobic microorganisms and they do require oxygen to respire and perform their oxidation to get energy. Um, two to four parts per million of dissolved oxygen is considered ideal. Um, in plants that have poor oxygen, it's less common for it to be an issue with the plant design and more commonly, it's uh, poorly functioning aerators. So many plants regulate their aeration basins using a dissolved oxygen probe, and that's great, much easier, but sometimes the probe breaks or it may have other issues and you might end up getting a false reading of adequate dissolved oxygen. Uh, the other big way that we see dissolved oxygen being an issue is when there's been a short-term drop in oxygen that's related to a slug load of high strength BOD that's very soluble and easily utilized. Uh, the heterotrophic bacteria are able to use those high strength slug loads very quickly, and they also have a high oxygen requirement. So when that happens, uh, they end up sucking out a lot of oxygen out of the water in a really short period of time. And if that low DO persists for 24 hours or more, it can definitely knock out a population of nitrifying bacteria. So some plants are able to do well at lower than two to four parts per million of dissolved oxygen. Uh, this is just kind of an ideal range for a typical activated sludge treatment plant. So the picture on the left here is an example of what good DO looks like in wastewater flocks. Uh, we look at these flocks under phase contrast using the 40X objective, no stain is used. The picture on the right is an example of what the low DO flocks look like in wastewater. Um, when we see samples that look like the one on the right, we may ask if there have been issues regarding aeration. Uh, for example, we may wonder if the aerator shut down due to power failure or other reasons, or if there is no good way for a plant to monitor the amount of DO in their aeration basin or be able to adjust it quickly. A uh, low DO can lead to anaerobic bacteria metabolism, which doesn't use as much nitrogen or phosphorus per carbon substrate as aerobic metabolism does. So you can get nitrogen as ammonia released into the water, um, resulting in higher effluent ammonia. Aerobic metabolism also produces compounds that bind strongly to oxygen, such as hydrogen sulfide and can release um, simple carbon compounds that make oxygen less available to nitrifiers. Um, incomplete denitrification in these anaerobic or anoxic conditions can also produce nitrite, and that may inhibit ammonia oxidizers, but it also makes the nitrite oxidizers require more oxygen to oxidize this back to nitrate. Um, another real important factor is carbonate uh, alkalinity. So um, in contrast to the heterotrophic flock formers, these autotrophic nitrifiers use inorganic carbon as their carbon substrate. Um, this carbon is used for their cellular components and they also use it to make their own organic carbon that they can then use for energy. So carbonate alkalinity is not the same as hardness. Um, hardness refers to the divalent cations in water, such as magnesium, calcium, iron, or manganese as the most common. Uh, this gets confusing because both hardness and alkalinity are reported in terms of parts per million of calcium carbonate. Um, alkalinity is measuring your buffering capacity of water. So it's the amount of hydroxides and carbonates in your water, which can be used to neutralize acids. Um, this is also not the same as pH, which measures the amount of acids or bases in your water. Um, alkalinity is essential for autotrophic nitrifiers, since again, uh, the carbonates and bicarbonates are what they really want to use as their carbon source. 
And all of the alkalinity together helps to neutralize the acids produced in the first step in nitrification, the oxidation of ammonia to nitrite, which produces acids as a byproduct. So nitrifiers will typically need uh, four to seven parts per million of carbonate per one part per million of ammonia that's entering the treatment plant. Um, to put that into terms of a standard municipal wastewater treatment plant that maybe gets 30 parts per million of ammonia in their influent, that will take about 120 to 210 parts per million of alkalinity. The EPA puts out a pretty good map, um, which I've got pictured here on the left, showing the carbonate alkalinity of surface water across the country. Um, as you can see, different areas of the country have um, may have lower carbonate alkalinity in their surface waters, and that may affect their nitrification in negative ways. Um, not all plants in those areas will end up with alkalinity deficiency because various types of suspended solids are also being added to the wastewater, and that can add a lot of alkalinity to a low alkalinity water. Um, if you do run into a case of low alkalinity, some common additives would be soda ash or lime. Lime has a variety of issues, mostly that it's not very soluble, so it makes it pretty difficult to use. And when it's solubilized well and used at a high rate, it's pretty common to have scaling issues in pumps and lines, and that can cause problems such as complete blockages. Um, if you do have low alkalinity, or if you start seeing swings in your pH from high acid to low acid to uh, high basic, that may indicate low alkalinity. Um, so we have a product called Boost and Lock that can be used to alleviate uh, this low alkalinity. Um, this product does also help in instances of low pH. So Boost and Lock is a blend of magnesium hydroxide, hydrated lime, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium carbonate. And this combination of ingredients provides superior pH stabilization when you compare it to either ingredient, any of those ingredients used alone. So the next stop on the nitrification wheel that we'll look at is pH, and that's the level of acidity or basicity in your um, treatment plant water, and it's important for a couple of reasons. So nitrifying bacteria are generally going to work best at a pH of 6.2 to 7.9, and the closer they are to around 7.2, the happier they're going to be. Um, ammonia oxidization produces acids, and too much acid that drops the pH down to around pH 5.5 will inhibit further ammonia oxidation. They can come back from it, though. Um, conversely, ammonia oxidizing bacteria uh, will either become dormant or may die at pH greater than pH 8.5. Beyond that, um, when you start getting that increasing pH to around pH 8.5, you end up getting conversion of ammonium to ammonia, so the NH4 plus ion to the NH3. Um, at high levels, either of these is actually toxic to your nitrifying bacteria, but ammonia, the NH3, is toxic at lower amounts than ammonium, the NH4 plus. So when a plant has a pH that gets up above pH 8.5, um, there starts to be uh, very serious inhibitory effects uh, and your ammonia is, is also going to sort of volatilize out of your wastewater plant, and that can cause an odor issue. Uh, most plants, except in industrial applications, will typically not have to deal with the high pH. Um, it's more common for wastewater treatment plants to be neutral, and the ones that do struggle with pH tend to be on the low end. So there's a couple of ways that operators for plants with low pH can deal with it. Um, usually they start by adding some sort of base to bring their pH up. Some examples would be caustic soda, which has a high pH. It's very easy to overshoot your pH and cause issues with if you're just using caustic soda. And it's also not very convenient to handle. Um, a good option is magnesium hydroxide, which does a good job to quickly increase the pH. Uh, it also won't go above pH 9. Um, you could also add our product Boost and Lock that we mentioned earlier to help increase and stabilize your pH. Um, it's recommended to use 
caustic soda, sodium hydroxide, or magnesium hydroxide, whichever is easier for you, if your pH is less than pH 6. And you just want to use that to initially get you up to pH 6 quickly and efficiently, and then switch to using Boost and Lock to go from pH 6 to pH 7. Um, using Boost and Lock will also help to hold the pH steady due to the added alkalinity, whereas the hydroxides, sodium hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide, won't have that effect. So at this point, we've touched on dissolved oxygen, uh, carbonate alkalinity, and pH. And then we've talked about what happens when nitrifiers are lost through a washout or due to toxicity. Um, for plants that have acute events that are in, and their carbonate, um, dissolved oxygen, and pH are all in good ranges, it's usually pretty simple to get nitrification back um, simply by adding additional nitrifying bacteria. For plants that have chronic issues, we like to work with them to help figure out which parameter it is that's causing them to continue um, their ongoing condition. And it may actually be several different conditions. So most bacteria in municipal wastewater, including the nitrifiers, will have a slower metabolism and slower growth rates as the temperature decreases. Um, generally, we try to quickly increase the population of nitrifiers in this situation, and added nitrifiers would be needed. Okay. The Vitastim dynamic duel is what we use to reseed bacteria when we know they're going to thrive well, and it's simply a matter of having too low a population for some reason. Um, the dynamic duel is a two-part product. So part one is the autotrophic nitrifiers, and they follow the nitrification pathway that we looked at at the beginning, oxidizing ammonia to nitrite and then to nitrate. The other part will consist of heterotrophic ammonia assimilators. So these are the bacteria that take up nitrogen and incorporate it directly into their cellular structure. It's just another way of lowering the ammonia in a treatment plant, and it also works well at a very low DO which is pretty handy for some systems. So we're just trying to cover two ways of getting the ammonia to come down. Um, the way it's used is typically the products are added at the same time, so you use both parts simultaneously. Uh, they're added directly to the aeration basin and they can establish themselves very quickly so operators get a real quick drop in ammonia. It's typical for us to do a 10-day treatment, and after those 10 days, um, not only is the ammonia dropped, but the nitrifiers are well established, and they're able to repopulate within the hydraulic retention time of the system. So there's no need to continue to keep adding these products beyond 10 days. Uh, we culture these bacteria in our lab through batch culturing method. So we start with some seed bacteria and we grow them in tanks, um, adding the right cofactors to build their populations up. And then when it's time to bottle them, we add some micronutrients. And those micronutrients help the bacteria establish quickly when they get into a wastewater treatment system. Um, the packaged product is stable for about six months. The only requirement is they do need to be refrigerated to extend that shelf life out. And beyond the six months, there's some slow drop off in the active concentration. Um, but we've had plenty of reports from operators that um, they had them refrigerated for a year and then used them after that year and still had great results. Um, one other thing I'll mention is that when we're culturing these um, bacteria, we're doing it with two big things in mind that are specific to wastewater. Uh, one is we want them to be well adapted to a high BOD environment, um, high strength wastewater. Um, the nitrifying bacteria that you might see in the aquarium fish store uh, is not really suited for high BOD environments. So when you add a product like that to a wastewater plant, um, they pretty much end up dying right away. And the other thing we focus on is uh, we try to make our nitrifiers more cold adapted than the general products we've seen out there. So a lot of times operators are having their biggest issues uh, with nitrification during the winter so we want our bacteria and our nitrifiers to be well suited, to be active and established quickly in cold environments. So here we've got some charts that give you an idea of how we dose this product. Um, the dosing rate is based on two main factors, uh, the influent flow rate. 
So how quickly water is moving through the plant and then the temperature. Um, the warmer the temperature, the less products are required. And as you move towards colder temperatures, more product is required. Um, say for an average 1 million gallon per day plant that doesn't have high influent ammonia, something like less than 40 parts per million ammonia. Um, if the temperature is 60 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, we'd be looking at adding about a gallon per day of each part of our uh, dynamic dual, um, the nitrifiers and the assimilators for a period of, of four days. And then we would cut back that dose quite a bit and do an additional maintenance dose for six days. Um, almost every time we'll be able to get the ammonia to drop down to where it needs to be. So um, for municipal, Municipal plants, on average, I would expect to see the effluent ammonia decrease in three days. Um, if not, we'd like to hear from you so we can explore what might be going on. Um, for plants that treat a lot of industrial waste, that has more variables to consider and needs to, and you also need to consider um, your production times and cleaning schedules. Um, I would give it about seven days to see some effect. If you don't see the ammonia starting to decrease in this time, or if it starts to go up, we would like to hear from you. Um, we would then need to get into more details about the plant and the operation setup and see um, if we miss some other cofactor. So sometimes, um, even with healthy flock, you may have problems with nitrification. Um, it's not often that this occurs, but sometimes you have mixed liquor that's just on the edge between healthy sludge and old sludge. Uh, the longer a system oscillates between these two sludge ages, the more that system will end up looking and behaving like old sludge. So just to review, with a young sludge, um, you tend to have high soluble BOD, which means the heterotrophs use nearly all the oxygen. And with old sludge age, the sludge may break up, or you may have bulking or foaming due to filament growth. Um, bulking and foaming can cause oxygen limitation or poor BOD removal or high TSS. Um, in some cases, you may have effluent ammonia levels that are higher than your influent ammonia levels. And this may actually be due to nitrogen limitation within the plant. Um, this could also be accompanied by scum formation, sliming or bulking, poor BLD removal, or high TSS. So nitrogen deficient sliming is generally found with influents that are high in carbon BOD or CBOD, but low in ammonia or TKN, total killjoy nitrogen. Uh, you may also have Zuglia structures over here on the bottom right and excessive EPS formation up there on the left-hand side. Um, high EPS production or high sliming may cause mild foaming or slow settling flocks. Uh, these types of flocks may carry over into your secondary clarifier and that could increase your TSS. Um, if you have foaming filaments that are also present, sliming may make your foaming much worse. Uh, due to their weak strength, low density flocks, you may also see an increase in TSS or poor BLD removal. Um, adding too much nitrogen, as a supplement in this situation, it doesn't really seem to cause that many problems other than your flock settle very f may start to settle very fast due to low EPS production. Um, okay, so nitrogen deficient bulking is generally characterized and accompanied by low influent ammonia, but high effluent ammonia. Uh, the filament we commonly see in this situation is type 0 to 1N or thiothrix. Uh, this filament can thrive in aeration basins with low nitrogen. And it's also somewhat resistant to chlorine. So chlorinating the return activated sludge may make your bulking worse. Um, mixed liquors with high populations of this filament can also sometimes form a thin scum on the surface. And it might make the mixed liquors seem slimy or stringy if you're pipetting it out with a pipette. Um, prolonged nitrogen deficiency can also lead to cell death. And when cells die, they release their internal contents. And this may include nitrogen compounds and ammonia. Um, this is also why you may see an increase in your effluent ammonia when you have bulking or foaming in your aeration basin. Um, nitrifiers may be present in both of these situations, but may be dormant. Um, that is, they will not be removing ammonia from your system. 
So as a summary, um, you must have good BOD removal before nitrification can occur. Uh, if your heterotrophs are not working efficiently and you consequently run into problems with your mixed liquor and sludge age, uh, your nitrifiers won't be functioning very well. They may be dormant if they are present. They may also just get washed out and not repopulate because they weren't being active. Um, some such conditions will also make it difficult to reestablish a large working population of nitrifiers. Uh, this is why I generally stress that first you need to have good BOD removal before we can try to do anything to increase your nitrification in a wastewater plant. Um, it's difficult to repopulate nitrifiers when it's due to factors you can't control. Uh, the typical situations will be temperature fluctuations, uh, mostly in winter when it goes from the negatives to 40 degree Fahrenheit uh, within a day and then back and forth for several days. Um, also washouts at any time with sudden fast flow rates. Um, Vitastim dynamic demo can help you repopulate um, once your conditions have passed. So nit the other thing is um, nitrogen deficiency may look like you have lost nitrification, and that's because you'll see an increase in your effluent ammonia levels, but you might actually be running on too little nitrogen for your plant. Um, in this case, adding nitrifiers will not help, but adding a good nitrogen source will. And we have a few options for that. Um, if you have any questions about it, you can talk to one of, the, one of our technical sales reps. Um, some common signs of nitrogen deficiency include effluent ammonia, that's higher than your influent ammonia, the presence of bulky filaments such as type 021N or thiothrix that cause bulking or a high 30-minute settling, um, or you might see sliming or high TSS from small low-density flocks.